we had to take a foreign language. So I actually studied a little Spanish in elementary and then I took German in junior high. Um, I got to high school and was just trying to decide what I wanted to study and ended up with Japanese. Um, and through my career within my Japanese program, I decided that I was going to major in Japanese. So I attended Dillard University in New Orleans and I majored in international business and Japanese studies and thought that I was going to go work for a Japanese company, right? Be a translator. Um, I actually did internships with Mazda and with Chevron. Wow. And I just realized those exactly weren't for me. I'm like, well, I want to really kind of give back to the community. So I returned back to Indianapolis. Um, the internships were out in California. So I returned back to Indianapolis and started working for a nonprofit, um, Girls Incorporated, where we focus on programs just for girls. Um, and was like, you know what? I think I'm going to go to grad school. I need to figure out what I want to do. Um, and based upon my experiences and my um my facilitation and coordination at Girls Inc. I'm like, I think I really wanna do um, international human rights. So I ended up at um, American University and I studied um, international politics and human rights, but I was also a Pickering fellow. And that's one of the uh, State Department programs that helps pay for your graduate degree. And so I went to American and that's how I ended up transitioning into the foreign service. Um, and when I go back and actually look at my application for undergrad, I talk about how I was going to be the ambassador to Japan. So I think it's really funny how it kind of came full circle. Haven't made it to Japan yet, but still a possibility. Soon, soon. Right? Uh, that's great. Um, I also want to let everyone know in the audience, feel free to put a question. Let me know in the chat if you want to ask a question. Happy to either let you go on camera and ask it live, or I'm happy to read the question. Just let me know what you prefer. Um, next on my screen, I have Luis. Luis, tell us your story. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, my name is Luis. I grew up in Houston, Texas, um, but my parents are from the border area of South Texas, Northern Mexico, um, and I grew up in a bicultural, bilingual environment, um, and so I always uh, was traversing different cultures and environments. And so uh, while I didn't know about the Foreign Service until I was in college from having a conversation with a diplomat in residence, very similar to the conversation we're having uh, here tonight, I definitely showed an affinity for both connecting uh, with others and trying to understand and being an interpreter of, and a representative of different kind of cultures and backgrounds. Um, and I studied uh, Latin American studies, Spanish, uh, Portuguese and government in college. I had a lot of interests. There was a lot of overlap and that has sort of been the foundation for my career interests in the foreign service in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs, which covers Latin America and Canada where I've served um, in my career. Thank you, Luis. Um, one point I want to just mention, and you didn't, is, um, and one thing I think many students in New Mexico might relate to you on, is that your father is multi-generational Hispanic from Texas. Do you mind just talking for a couple seconds about how that sort of has impacted you or how that has helped or? Yeah, I think, um, so I like to say that while being a diplomat isn't um, something that uh, prior generations in my family did, I would say service to the country um, has been. So my dad, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather all are were or are military veterans. My great-grandfather, Hilario Gonzalez, uh, served in World War I. Uh, from South Texas and my grandfather in World War II and my dad in Vietnam. And so to me, foreign service uh, has been a way to connect uh, with uh, service that my family has done. And it's also been really interesting to also represent this aspect of America's rich culture, uh, the contributions of uh, Hispanics and Latinos uh, to American culture, especially for folks from the border areas where there's a long history um and connection to the land thank you Luis. next nathan 
Tell us a little bit about your journey. Hey, thank you. Can you hear me? Great, great. So uh, thank you for inviting us all here today. Nice to see you again and fellow colleagues as well from Mexico City at some point or another. Actually, so so me, you and I met not even in Mexico City. We met somewhere like in Florida or something at one point and then, we did. And then <laughs> reconnected in Mexico City. Yeah. Absolutely. So, we, we met actually, so everyone knows, because you were working in Latin America and we were working on tech policy issues related to Latin America. We were doing environmental and scientific types of, yeah, work there. Yes, I remember. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so where I grew up. So I'm actually a military brat. Um, kind of like, you know, this, the same thing that Luis was was just talking about. So so my my parents were both in the army, my mom and my dad. Um, and my mom is from Louisiana, from Southwest Louisiana. My dad is from Northern Mississippi, from Tunica, Mississippi. Um, and they had me in Germany. And then when I was about, I think going towards second grade, we moved back to Louisiana to a military base called Fort Polk. Um, and I grew up in a town called Leesville, right by that military base, most of my life. As I said, my mom was from Southwest Louisiana, so so the Lafayette area. So that, so that was the closest base that they can get to that was close to their homes. Um, so I was raised there from like second to eighth grade. Then we moved up to another military base in New York um, and then moved back um, so I could finish out high school in Leesville and then went off to college. I, I say all that to, to say that my upbringing, I, it kind of had, it, it kind of lent towards this type of career. Like being, being in the foreign service, we, we move around quite a bit. You know, we move around every two to three years from place to place, country to country, embassy to embassy. Um, but me, you know, one, I had that international exposure early on being born abroad. Two, I knew what it was like to move around every now and then, like from, from military base to military base. And three, I knew what it was like to be in a public service family. You know, like like both of my parents were, were in the army, you know, working for the government. So all that together, it it really was kind of a seamless transition for me to go into something like the Foreign Service. I didn't hear about it, though, until so after I was an undergrad, uh, I did a few study abroads. I, I studied abroad in London, then I studied abroad in Hong Kong. And when when I was in Hong Kong, I saw an advertisement in a magazine um, that said, be the face of America to the world. Right. And um, this was about the time that the, the recently passed the late Secretary General Colin Powell, he was about to become Secretary of State. So this was the year 2000. And I was like, wow, I can I can do that. You know, I can, I can work for him, you know, and um, and I had just been out teaching English in Northwest China. So I was like, I just did that. I was the face of America to that part of the world, at least like that. There were hardly any other Americans there. And so I was like to make a, a career out of that and to get paid, you know, and 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 have a full time job doing that kind of thing. I, I can really dig that. And so I went ahead and I took the exam, the Foreign Service Officer test in uh, when I was in Hong Kong, thinking I was just going to go ahead and pass it and join the Foreign Service. Well, I, I didn't quite pass it the first time. Not, not quite. I didn't pass it the first time I had. Uh, I got close, but. I didn't. So then I went out and I taught English for a while in China. And I was kind of I was kind of upset about that because I thought I was pretty smart, you know, coming up, um, not passing that exam. But I didn't find out until later that a lot of people don't pass that exam <laughs> the first time they take it. It takes it takes time sometimes, you know. Um, so then I went back to grad school. I went to Seton Hall University. I studied uh, diplomacy and international relations. And I did a master's in that and a master's in Asian studies. And then um, I took the test again my first year passed one part, didn't pass the second part. I did an internship in between my first two, first year of grad school, second year of grad school, which I think was the most crucial part because our student programs are really important. Um, and then I took the test again my second year and I passed it, but not the second part. I didn't have my second part, but I also applied for that thing that um, you mentioned Luis was, the Presidential Management Fellowship. So I got that too. So I, that's how I started. I was a presidential management fellow first in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs doing public affairs work. And then I passed the other part of my test. So I switched over to the Foreign Service about a year or so into the program. 
and I've been doing that ever since. That's great. I think it's a really important point about taking the test multiple times. Oftentimes when people ask me about taking the foreign service test, there's a fear that it's so hard and they have to study and that if they don't pass, when I, what I say is take it, see what it's like, start to get a feel for it and study. But at least if you've taken it, you know what to expect. Exactly. That's what I recommend. Dive in. You know, it's, it's okay not to pass it the first time. And you can take it as many times as you need, except for you can only take it once a year. Yeah. That's the only downside. Catherine, tell us about your journey. Hi, Soledad. And thanks for having me. Hello, fellow panel members. Uh, so my name's Catherine. I am from uh, Virginia near Washington, D.C. Grew up in a very multicultural environment. Uh, so in, in undergrad, I did, uh, I started out as a Spanish major and, oh no, I'm sorry, I started out as an international studies major and I didn't have a diplomat of residence that was in contact with our program. So I didn't know anything about the foreign service and I wasn't even sure what I could do with that degree. So I added Spanish be, just to make sure, you know, I had my bases covered employment wise. Um, my school had, I went to Virginia Commonwealth University uh, the Spanish program there had either a, a Spanish literature track or uh, translation interpretation. So if you were a Spanish major, you pick one of those. Uh, so I went the translation interpretation route. Uh, so I'm a professionally trained uh, translator and interpreter. Um, I've had some jobs, you know, uh, working in that area. My preference is, is the medical arena, but I just have learned that you make more money as a translator and interpreter uh, doing legal work. For the, so I decided to look, you know, for other jobs. Uh, I went, I decided to do uh, Peace Corps and I was sent to Panama. I was an English teacher in Panama for two years. It's a great experience. If you guys have any questions about Peace Corps, um, I highly recommend it. It's even better now because you can uh, apply to the country you want to go to. But when I did it, you had to be available for anything and they would pick where you where they'd send you. Uh, so then uh, when you do Peace Corps, you get something called non-competitive eligibility, which helps you get government jobs, which would be civil service. So government jobs are generally either civil service, which is traditionally in the US or with the State Department and a few other agencies, foreign services, which is what we're here to talk about. But my first job uh, with the government using my non-competitive eligibility from Peace Corps. Uh, I was civil service at the Foreign Service Institute, which is uh, the, where the State Department does all of their training, language training, all leadership training, area studies, all kinds of training. Um, so I was in the office that does retirement planning seminars. So it was my first job with the State Department. And it was there that I made a, a contact with people uh, who, you know, we were dealing mostly with foreign service people that would come in to take our classes. And there was a new program that had opened up. Uh, it's a language-based, my, my foreign service job is language-based. So I was hired for Spanish to do consular work. Consular work is, uh, you know, involves a lot of things, mainly visas and passports, working in US embassies abroad and assisting American citizens. Um, and so, just from the contacts I had there, uh, they, you know, encouraged me to to, uh, to apply. I really wanted to use my Spanish in a professional setting. You know, I worked really hard on my Spanish. I have a Spanish degree. I was an interpreter, I did Peace Corps. So it just seemed like a natural transition. Uh, and I've I made it in. The test is very similar to the regular Foreign Service Officer test. The name of my program now is called the Consular Fellows Program. It's language based. So um, there have been, you know, they open up the program to, to a variety of languages, just depends on what the needs are at the moment. Um, I think right now it's open to Portuguese speakers, Spanish speakers, and Chinese speakers. In the past, they've had consular fellows for Arabic, for Russian, for French. And it's a great program. Um, you, so you're guaranteed to be sent to somewhere where your language will be used. Um, and I've gotten two amazing posts out of this program. First was Bogota, uh, and now I'm in Mexico City. And both are uh, really nice places, so it's worked out really well. Thank you, Catherine. I think 
Um, it's really great to hear the different paths that people have taken. And actually, a couple of weeks ago, we did a panel on Peace Corps for, for UNM. So if there's anyone who's out there now who's interested, please go look at our video. Um, email me or email Lenny, um, and we can definitely send you the video for the Peace Corps program and put you in touch with the UNM Peace Corps person. Um, so the next question I'm going to ask is, about your day to day. Um, and I know that each of you have had very different jobs in the times that in the time that you've been working for the State Department. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the job you have now, what your day to day looks like, um, and even maybe some of the jobs you've had in the past, and what people should expect, you know, I think there's this idea that I'm going to be a diplomat, and I'm suddenly going to be sitting in these rooms, negotiating peace treaties with you know, so and so. That is the truth for some people, but that there that's not what it's like for everybody and that there are different jobs and different cones. Um, let's go back to Danye. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about your day to day now and in the past and give us some accurate expectations. For sure. Um, I'll, I'll speak in terms of <laughs> speak in terms of public affairs. Um, so I've been the public affairs officer in um, Dahran and Saudi Arabia, the ACAO, our assistant cultural affairs officer in um, here in Mexico City, as well as in Cairo. And a lot of times, a lot of my day to day is a matter of looking for program partners. I'm out looking to see, looking for um, NGOs. I'm looking for businesses. Um, there's a lot of coordination between uh, us as far as the U.S. government and the local government and trying to figure out what it is that the community needs. Um, I know in some cases people feel like we kind of like our job is to go in and say these are the programs we want to implement, but that's not really the best way to actually create a partnership It's more so going to the partners and saying, what type of programs do you have? Um, what are some of the gaps and what are some of the ways that we can help you with those programs? Um, so for example, today I had a conversation with uh, some organizers of a jazz festival here in Mexico City. And um, they want to do a big event for their 50th anniversary. Um, and all they say is we want a big name, right? Um, and I'm like, that's nice. We, we probably won't be able to afford some of those big names. We still have a government budget. Um, but it's like, what else can we do to make this happen, right? What type of big names are you looking for? What type of impact are you looking for? Um, our goal is to make sure that we can kind of build up the skills of the, the people who are doing the work in the country. And so what we decided was to uh, chat with Alvin Ailey and see if we can't get some of their dancers to come down and talk about the evolution of jazz and how jazz has impacted dance and other art forms, um, and also have them do some master classes. So to work with some of the dancers here in the country, right? So the idea is that we're constantly teaching someone that can go and teach someone else. So it's not a concert for the sake of having a concert, but it's trying to put and connect people and people together so that they can learn off of each other and so that they can build their skills, whether it's Americans here or Mexicans the other way. That sounds like a super cool job, Danye. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. So and, and it's in terms of arts, it's in terms of sports. I mean, dance, we've got hip hop classes, right? And all kinds of different sectors. I think the F1, the formula racers, right? The F1 race is here tomorrow. Um, and so we're going to try to go out and see what is it that we could partner with going forward. And you bring other people from the embassy that maybe have or have some sort of stake in it as well. So. Great. My job Thank is awesome. You so much. Yeah. I can't wait to come visit you. Um, mm -hmm. Luis, tell us a little bit about your day to day now and when, you know, and actually I think, tell us about your day to day in Washington versus when you're international. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things, one of the traits that a foreign service officer sort of embodies is adaptability. Um, and, you know, as a foreign service generalist, uh, you're, you are within one of five career tracks or cones, you know, political, economic, consular, public diplomacy, and management. And, you know, we have those officers represented here. 
But in my first three tours in the Foreign Service, I was a consular officer, a economic officer, and now I'm a political officer. Um, so I've gotten to explore the, the different tracks and I'm adaptable. What's different for me uh, being a political officer here in Washington versus having been an economic officer in, uh, at an embassy is um, in, when, you, when I was in an embassy, I was the eyes and ears of the United States on the situation in a country. And I was also there uh, to be the friend or partner uh, of the United States with uh, key contacts uh, in country, whether it's in the government, in the business sector, the nonprofit sector, academia, I was there to sort of uh, connect with and better understand everything that was going on because without that connection, Washington, where I work now, uh, and where policy making, where decisions are made uh, and our policy is shaped, doesn't have that information, is, is blind to what happens in country. And so what I see here in Washington is um, some of the uh, intersections of what we do at an embassy with what is done um, to sort of align our efforts as the whole government, right? Like there's, you know, our foreign policy is not just State Department, it's Department of Defense, it's, you know, Department of Education, Department of Housing and Urban Development. There are technical experts uh, that connect to all kinds of foreign policy issues. And so uh, I currently work in a country desk and a country desk is basically the Washington DC State Department office that touches any and all issues related to that country in the Washington context. So any federal agency or office at state that might have a question or might be doing some kind of work related to your country will intersect with your desk and will inform them of sort of what are the key priorities and what's happening in country. So you're, you, you sort of uh, uh, help feed into decisions and conversations here in Washington. Um, and you really depend on what you hear uh, from fellow diplomats at, at post. Thank you, Luis. Nathan, tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day now, which is very unique and special, um, yeah. but also talk to us a little bit about what your day-to-day -day was like when you were um, at various embassies. Sure, sure, sure. So um, as my colleague just mentioned, we have five different cones uh, or career tracks, but we call them cones, C-O-N-E-S in the Foreign Service. There's, there's management, there's consular, public diplomacy, economics, and political, right? I've, um, I've, I've had a, a, a sort of unique career in that I've done all of those cones. Um, I started off as a PMF doing public affairs, a PMF, a presidential management fellow, remember? and that's civil service. So I've, I've done civil service, foreign service, in DC, in the field, you know, a bit, a bit of everywhere. Um, so I started off doing public affairs there. Then I went to China and I did a consular tour, which I'm not going to talk about consular work because Catherine can speak on that. Then I went to our U.S. embassy to the Vatican, which, yes, we do have a U.S. embassy to the Holy See. And I was doing, I was the public affairs officer there. Um, partially because of my previous public affairs work there, in which, as Donier was saying, um, that's one of the coolest types of jobs. The, like the, the things you get to do as a public affairs officer is very, it's very unique and it's very, very cool. But I won't talk about that because she spoke about that already. Then I went back to D.C. and I worked um, in the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs, so the office that that, that manages marine environmental protection issues and um, Antarctic issues and Arctic issues, all of those. I will talk about that in a second because that's that's very unique too and it's pretty cool. And that's where we, that's, no, we didn't meet then, but we met in my next assignment when I was at the embassy to Belize, to Belmopan Belize, and I was the political and economic section chief there. Um, but as you just heard from Luis, he pretty much explained what a political and economic officer does in the field and back home, so I won't talk about that. Um, and then finally, I was at the U.S. Embassy to Mexico City, which is, a, not all of us have had the privilege of 
either serving there or being there now that it's actually a really really cool post and kind of hard to get it's it's big it's one of our biggest missions in the world mission mexico but it's a it's a hidden gem just because mexico city has it all um so yeah y'all are the, the most of are there now i hope you're really enjoying it because it's a cool cool place um so i did management work there and i'll talk about that in a second because i don't think anybody else will talk about that what i'm doing now I'm, I'm back home in the state of Louisiana. I'm based at the at Tulane University. And I, I know Donye says she went to Dillard. So I, I wanna connect with you later about that. Um, I am the diplomat in residence for the Louisiana, Mississippi and Arkansas region. So I'm doing recruiting, which is a really, really cool job because I didn't hear about the foreign service if you remember until I was a senior in undergrad. So it's it's good to be able to speak to students and other professionals about it at an earlier stage. To, so because it, it takes time and our student programs are important to go ahead and get started early. So I'm glad to be able to do that now. What I do on a day-to-day -day basis here now, I just started last, last year, last September. Um, so I started during COVID. So normally what I would be doing is going out and meeting people in person, doing career fairs and, you know, like doing all that kind of stuff. Not, I haven't had that experience. Everything has been virtual, everything. So we've been doing like virtual, we've been doing this, like what I'm doing with you at this moment, like, like these virtual info sessions, we've been doing virtual career fairs, um, you know, doing outreach to various universities, various professional organizations, but everything virtually and, and trying to, and I have office hours, you know, and every, we have 16 diplomats and residences throughout the country and we all have our own territories and and we have um, office hours and everything. Um, and what we do is we speak to anybody who's interested in joining the Foreign Service, joining the State Department and trying to help them along their journey, giving them resources, trying to help them out so that they achieve their goals. Um, so that's what I do now on a day-to-day -day basis. When I was in Mexico in the management section, what the management section is, is concerned with is the internal operations of an embassy. So trying to make sure that the platform is, is running to support all the other sections. So the management officer would be the one that oversees like the IT section, the financial management section, the human resources section, the facilities management section, the, um, the medical unit, you know, and, and just all of the different internal sections, even like the people who are concerned with all of the logistics. So that's where I was. I was in what's called the general services office, which is basically working on logistical issues. So my, my first year there, I was in charge of any of the logistics for any VIP visit that we had. And our relationship with Mexico is hugely important. It's one of our biggest bilateral relationships in the world, partially because of where it's located. There's a lot of trade going back and forth. It's our neighbor to the South, lots of issues we have to collaborate with. So. There were a lot of VIPs who came down to Mexico quite often, a lot of senators, a lot of um, congressional delegations, the Secretary of State came often, um, other cabinet level officials would come, the vice president even came when I was there. Um, so whenever somebody of that level would come, then me and my section, we would be responsible for handling all of the logistics of those trips. And my second year there, I was responsible for all of the purchasing of the embassy. So I was the main contracting officer um, dealing with all of the procurements of the embassy and the purchasing. That was Mexico City management type of work. When I was in the office of Ocean and Polar Affairs, that was my favorite job so far in the Foreign Service, to be honest with you. Um, there, I was the head of the US delegations to two different international treaties that we were signatories to related to the protection of the ocean. And so what I was doing, as um, as you heard from Luis just a while ago, I was collaborating with a lot of the technical experts within the government. So on my issues, ocean related issues, it was people like from EPA, from, from NOAA, from the Coast Guard, the Department of the Navy, you know, anybody who had stakes in the water, right? Um, and so what we would do is I, I would have to coordinate throughout the federal government um, our, our positions, our stances on whatever issues that were being covered in those, in those international treaties. And then um, we would do that kind of diplomacy internally to get our positions down, which was oftentimes 
more contentious than doing diplomacy outside of our government. But so we would do that first and then take those set positions and go to the, the annual meetings or biannual meetings and then negotiate what we wanted with other countries, with the rest of the world. So that's what I was doing um, there as the, the head of delegation to those, those two treaties. That yeah, sounds that's about cool. It. <laughs> yeah, no, you've had a lot of really interesting jobs. Uh, Catherine, tell us about your day to day um, and maybe what it was like in Colombia versus Mexico. Sure. So, uh, so I do consular work. Uh, cons most almost every embassy has a consular section, uh, and then the consular within the consular section, there are different functions that we do. Um, so, in Colombia. Uh, the sections that they had were American citizen services. Uh, and then within the visa section, you have non-immigrant visas and then immigrant visas, two different categories. Non-immigrant visas would be tourists, students, temporary work visas, um, things like that. And then immigrant visas are when a relative, uh, someone petitions for their relative to immigrate to the US. So those are different, different sections, different type of work. Uh, so in, in Colombia, I did non-immigrant visas. Uh, and immigrant visas. So basically your morning is visa interviews. You come in, uh, there's a line of people waiting, <laughs> waiting to get their shot to you know, plead their case to a consular officer. And then you evaluate their situation and you make a determination whether they're eligible for the visa or not. Um, the immigrant visas uh, are a little more involved. Um, US citizens have a right to petition for their relatives uh, and you know, there's, there are different standards that apply there. So uh, it's, just, it's still an interview, it's still, but it's a lot of paperwork and it's a lot of making sure that you're um, kind of checking all the boxes on what you need to do for those, uh, those visa types. I also had the opportunity in Colombia to do a few temporary duty assignments, which we call TDYs. Uh, I went to um, Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic uh, to do non-immigrant visas. And then I went to Georgetown, Guyana for three months to do immigrant visas. Uh, and it was a really interesting experience. So that's, you know, in any of those places, it's really the same thing. You come in, you do your interviews, um, and then you have a lot of back office work afterwards. Um, that's when you're in the visa section. So here in Mexico City, uh, I, I spent a year in American Citizen Services where you, uh, we process passports, people come in to apply for passports. The majority of our applicant pool here for passports would be people who were born in the U.S. but left, you know, as babies, and they really aren't culturally connected to the U.S. But they're still U.S. citizens; they're still entitled to their passports. Uh, so they come into the embassy to get their passport, and we, you know, evaluate their ID and citizenship evidence to see if it meets the standard to be able to issue them a passport. Also. Uh, we issue consular reports of birth abroad, which we call CRIBAs. So if you're a US citizen and you have a baby outside of the US, um, there not everybody qualifies to transmit citizenship to their baby. So we do those evaluations. It depends on how much time you spent in the US prior to your child's birth uh, and make those determinations. Also uh, with American Citizen Services, there are a lot of other things that go on. Uh, we visit prisoners. I've been to lots of prisons in Mexico. Uh, my portfolio was uh, the detentions portfolio, which, uh, which is immigration detention. So it's US citizens in the process of being deported from Mexico, which really surprises people. People don't realize Americans get deported. Please don't come here without a passport because <laughs> Mexico will deport you. Lots of people cross the border, uh, no passport because they've been able to do it forever with their birth certificate. They let you back in, but uh, Mexico is not a fan of that unless you, if you're outside of the border area, cross the border, come all the way to Mexico City, get stuck in an immigration checkpoint, and then now you're our detention case and you will be deported after a few weeks in immigration detention. So for those cases, uh, we issue them emergency passports because they can't be deported without a passport. Uh, so that's that's basically, yeah, that's that's what we do. And also in Mexico, there are nine consulates and the embassy. So the embassy is where, you know, all the political stuff happens. Um, I'll, you know, lots of government agencies are here. I don't know if anybody has the number of how many agencies we have here, but it's a lot. Uh, and then the nine other consulates we have 
uh, they all have, they all provide consular services, so visas uh, and American citizen services, passports, the whole thing. Um, and then depending on where they're located, uh, they offer additional services, have different presence from different agencies as needed, so. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, so for a long time, the State Department has been described as pale male Yale. And it still has a problem with diversity, both um, Latinos and African Americans and people of some other um, ethnic backgrounds are underrepresented, but particularly Blacks and Latinos. Um, I'm interested in having each of you speak a little bit to your experience um, as people who are not pale male Yale. <laughs> um, and maybe some of the challenges that you've had and some of the advice you might have given, you know, yourself when you first joined. Um, Danye, let's start with you. That's a great question. Um, I will say that, yes, that's the history. I will say that the State Department is working on uh, increasing its diversity numbers. You have programs like the Pickering Trump Thomas R. Pickering, Charles B. Rango programs um, that are aimed at cre uh, increasing the number of minorities within the State Department. Um, I, I've experienced some discrimination um, from my fellow colleagues. Um, there are times, I mean, I will say that I feel like we've been adults enough so that we can sit down and have those conversations. Um, I think that the most interesting experiences for me was as a female in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> um, and so the idea of being an honorary man to some degree, um, a lot of times when I go out to do public diplomacy, people are not looking for an African-American woman to show up. They're looking for a white man to show up or a white woman to show up to represent the, um, so you represent the United States. And so I just take it as a learning opportunity to say, you know, the US is actually very diverse. Um, and then we go into talking about, you know, the different types of um, cultures that we have in the US. I don't like to use the term melting pot because it gives the idea that you have to melt it all together to create one type of culture. Um, I usually use a mix of like a, like a kosher or like a stew. So you've got these different ingredients that are in one pot together, but it's the sauce that kind of keeps them with the same flavor, but they still maintain their identities, right? And so that's kind of how I like to explain the United States. But there were times in Saudi that it was, it was very different. Um, I guess there are some funny times too, where you just kind of have to laugh. For example, I went to a cultural event and um, they were not expecting a woman. And this place actually did not have bathrooms for a woman. <laughs> so if we needed to go to the bathroom, the security actually had to go in and ask everyone to leave um, so that we could use the bathroom. Um, there were times in Saudi, they have different doors. So there's a door for single men, and then there's a door for men who are with families or for single women or just families. Um, and so they they kind of didn't know what to do when I showed up. And they're like, well, well we have this woman here. What, what are we supposed to do with her? And so I just found that they were great opportunities to talk about diversity, whether it's in terms of gender, culture, ethnicity, right? I, I like kind of going into those spaces and it's like, you know, you realize now that you may have an issue and that you may need the opinions of others and the outlook and perspective of other people and why that's important. And any advice you would have given yourself before you started this adventure? Um, I mean, you just go in lighthearted, right? Go in lighthearted. People are usually unaware of some of their biases and you can kind of help them become aware of that. Um, but you're not going to get your point across if you are always, if you kind of come off with like a chip on your shoulder, right? You're going to have to be a little softer in your approach in order for people to acknowledge some of the biases that they have. So just go in ready to laugh about it to some degree and know when to bring it up. And sometimes the conversations need to be had privately, you know, and sometimes there are things that you need to address publicly. So. Great, thank you. Luis, tell us about yeah. your experiences. Yeah, I, I think um, similarly, I think there are, you know, 
issues of diversity at the department. I come from multiple lenses at this. So I'm LGBT and until, you know, 30 years ago, um, LGBT foreign service officers were, you know, basically kicked out of the foreign service um, uh, for their sexual orientation uh, or identity. Uh, and I'm Latino. So there's, you know, a, an intersection. Um, what I found really interesting um, was serving in Mexico, being of Mexican American heritage and speaking Spanish uh, pretty fluently with, with a Mexican accent. I had, I found myself having to identify myself uh, as a foreign service officer in a way that my colleagues didn't have to, um, either starting meetings by saying, I am a US foreign service officer uh, or adding it to my signature in my email, US Foreign Service Officer, um, because otherwise uh, people would gravitate to other people, uh, my colleagues, uh, who were you know, unaware that this was happening. Um, so uh, I actually gave that advice to my successor in my position in Mexico City, who uh, shockingly is also a Luis, uh, so I told I told him you might want to do this. Also, there's the Luis precedent. Um, so it was interesting for you know Mexicans not necessarily used to potentially a Mexican American that speaks Spanish being their U.S. Um, um, sort of counterpart. Um, and I think it's important for us to be in those positions to reflect back. Uh, both America and reflect sort of biases uh, within the country. And I think it's important. Um, and sometimes it's difficult, right? Um, uh, to be in a place where there might be these biases that affect you. Um, but uh, I also thought, think it's really interesting because a lot of countries can reflect on sort of the commonalities with the US. Uh, I served in Brazil, which is both a country of immigrants and a country similar to the US that is still grappling with the legacy of uh, slavery and sort of uh, racism um, and having conversations about both immigration, racism and sort of a multicultural society are conversations that are enriched by having diverse diplomats uh, representing the US and sort of engaging in those uh, difficult conversations. Thank you, Luis. Um, you need to tell us the advice you'd give yourself. But before you do, um, if anybody has any questions, please, please, please raise your hand, drop a note in the chat. Now's your time to ask a question. Um, so Luis, what, what would be your advice you'd give yourself? Uh, tell everyone you're a foreign service officer is my advice. And it's something I live by. Uh, don't assume people assume that you are a diplomat. Great, thank you. Nathan, tell us about your experiences um, as a diverse person in an organization that isn't known for diversity. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, first, I'd like to say that, that um, what the department is trying to do, even like my marching orders as a State Department recruiter, our we have two main priorities. And one of those two is to recruit for diversity. I mean, so, so that is that is a very like concerted effort on behalf of the Department of State is to try to bring in more diversity. So it's something that's, that's recognized, that's lacking, um, and something that we are trying to fix. Um, and that, that comes from the, the, the president to the secretary on down. Like our secretary oftentimes speaks about how we are, our strength as a nation is our diversity and if we're not utilizing that in our foreign policy in our diplomatic court then we're, we're like fighting this battle with one hand tied behind our backs so it's it's a, it's a message that's from that's coming from the top down right and he even installed our first ever chief diversity and inclusion officer um earlier this year in the history of the department so so it's something that's that's truly recognized, and people are making a, a concerted effort to try to remedy, you know, the the lack of diversity. Um, 
one thing that Donye spoke about was the how how when when she went to meet external contacts, sometimes they weren't expecting to see an African American female. They were expecting to see, you know, a Caucasian American. Um, I've had that experience not only externally but internally in the department. You know, like um, sometimes I'll show up and people think, "Oh, you must be one of the Marines." oh, you must be the regional security officer or so, something along those lines. You, you must be diplomatic security, something physical, right? It always has to be something physical. It's never, oh, you must be the political and economic section chief or, oh, you, you're the acting deputy chief of mission. You know, usually it's more like that. It's more like the, the question in the shot. Oh, it's you, you're the you're the acting deputy chief of mission. And and that kind of a thing, you know, it's 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 like the, it's nothing that's, malicious but it's those microaggressions that we have to deal with at times right you know it's, it's it's not done with a racist intent but it's just those unconscious biases that people have not expecting somebody like me somebody who looks like me to be holding whatever position that is even as i was listening to louise talk about his issue that that was something i had never thought about before about about being a louise in mexico and have, having people automatically think that you just must be and and not saying that that the like we, we have locally engaged staff at every mission, so we have Mexicans working at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico, and they're amazing. You know, like they have great English, smart people, some named Luis. You know, <laughs> like in and so um, it's 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 not any swipe at them, but people may automatically think that oh yeah, so you you you're not the U.S. diplomat. You you might just be uh, uh, you know locally employed staff. Um, I had never thought about that, Luis. So, so thanks for for bringing that out. And to all the Luises out there, you know, uh, <laughs> take his advice, right? Speak up and tell and tell who you are. Um, and Pablo an, and Soledad's too, Nathan. What's up? Hmm? And the Pablos and the Soledad's and the <laughs> all of y'all, yeah, <laughs> all my folks. Um, but but sometimes what what we feel though is like like Luis said, you have to kind of show who you are. Right, you you have to you have to announce it, or you or you have to prove it in a certain way. Um, sometimes I find people may take that overboard, and it may come off, you know, because we're all like intelligent folks working at the, you, you. You all have to pass the same test. You all have to meet certain thresholds. So you know, you're you're all we're all intelligent folks, and and so sometimes we have to show our intelligence to make people realize that we're on the same level. You know. Um, Sometimes I find people take it overboard and may come off too intimidating, which which I I, I don't think is is the best look. But you know that, that's something that our colleagues who are pale male and from Yale don't necessarily have to do. They can walk in and they're already accepted, right? So so that's something that that um we need to deal with. But but we have these courses that everybody has to take on unconscious biases and things. You know things to try to make people think about that kind of those kinds of issues before they become bigger issues. Um, sometimes it helps being somebody who looks like me. Like, for example, when I was posted in Belmont Pan Belize, um, the country of Belize is more Caribbean than anything else. And so the people of Belize more look like me, you know? So, so like sometimes when I would go to meet a, a minister or a vice minister, I would get the comment like, oh, they finally sent somebody who who actually looks like us, you know, <laughs> you know, talking about the United States, right? Like, like they, they finally sent one of you. And our my my experience in the country of Belize was just far more, I don't know, I got I integrated in the in the society far more than my other colleagues were able to, you know, like even to this day, if you look at my Facebook friend list a good third of them are from Belize. You know, like I, I, I actually, we actually made really, really good friends and, 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 um, and it fit in really well in the, in the society, in the community in Belize. So it was, it was really nice. One thing, another thing that, that I don't particularly care about um, is sometimes it does get kind of lonely because the State Department is wide, right? We have posts in over 190 countries, all kinds of embassies. And we're a small foreign service, relatively small. We have like 7,000 some people in the foreign service or something like that. Um, so so sometimes you can be at, at a post with nobody who looks like you. 
like nobody who shares any of the same background or values like, as, as you do. Um, and that can be lonely. Like sometimes you just want to come back, like when I was in China, right? Sometimes you just want to come back from that visa line of speaking Chinese all day and speak to somebody who, who may have known things you knew. Like you want to ask them, you remember that time on that on Martin when they had that episode and you know like laugh about something like that or you remember that song that we used to jam to back in, you know but if there's nobody who kind of <laughs> has that background it gets kind of lonely you know um so so that's the advice that I would give myself is that I found that at smaller posts you have a higher risk of being in that type of situation at bigger posts you have a better chance of having a more diverse selection like you may get two or three other officers who look like you. Um, so that's the advice that I would give myself. Stick to the bigger posts. That's great. Catherine, tell us about your experiences and the advice you'd give yourself. Um, and then uh, we will have a question um, from Teresa after you say that, uh, after you give us your answer. Hey, uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, my first job with the State Department was uh, helping run the retirement planning seminars. And looking at the people retiring, you know, after 30 years of 30, sometimes 40 years of being in the foreign service, it was mostly white men uh, that were retiring as ambassadors and, you know, almost no diversity in that group at all. Uh, sometimes a few white women would make their way in somehow, but very little diversity aside from that. Um, so, you know, definitely the department has a very long way to go. Um, but, you know, we, we do see, you know, my current situation, my bosses, um, there's a little bit more diversity now in my boss within my immediate supervisors. However, I would say still most of our ambassadors higher level, um, you know, when you're getting up there are still lacking, uh, severely lacking, uh, diversity. So hopefully that's just a question of time for those people to just retire and the new generation, you know, moves up, um, you know, just based on personal experiences, you know, as a woman living in Latin America, you know, you just deal with lots of your regular machismo stuff. Um, I've been asked lots of times, you know, just in, outside of the embassy, are you here for your husband's job? <laughs> Things like that. Uh, people seem to be confused that, oh, I would be here by myself working as a diplomat. Um, but I would say within, inside the embassy, the, I feel like discrim the discrimination that you witness would be more towards my colleagues who are people of color. Um, me as a white woman, I'm not experiencing a ton of prejudice. Um, it's just, you know, with my own situation. So, you know, there have been a lot of uh, talks in the past few years about diversity and inclusion. There's a council, there are, um, the department had, you know, started making an effort to have conversations uh, within our section. We've had a lot of conversations um, and, you know, we're it's really showing us that we all have a lot to learn uh, to make improvements in that area. So. Right. And any advice you'd give yourself, Catherine? Oh, um, just be a, be a good listener uh, when your, you know, friends who are people of color are expressing their experiences with racism, just listen to what they have to say and be supportive as best you can. Great, thank you. So we have a question from Catherine. Catherine, do you mind turning on your camera and asking your question? I'm sorry, Teresa, sorry. <laughs> Teresa. No worries, no worries. Right, Hi, can everyone... <laughs> Go ahead, Teresa. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering uh, what languages um, you guys had to learn for the Foreign Service, whether before you entered or uh, like with the Foreign Service in mind, as well as uh, languages you were asked to learn um, for postings and uh, what specific paths or um, uh, scholarships and um, tools you guys use to do that and um, specifically in Arabic, if anyone uh, speaks Arabic, but in any language. Thank you. Can I take this one? Uh, so for my program, for Consular Fellows, you have to have a language to come in. That's the requirement of the program. Uh, and as I mentioned, it, there previously was a Consular Fellow Arabic program. I would imagine they'd be bringing back 
as many as they can as, in terms of the different language groups for consular fellows, uh, because there's a lot of consular work to be done that was delayed because of COVID. So I would just keep your eyes open uh, to see if any of those opportunities come up. Uh, but so I'm not a foreign service generalist. I'm not a career diplomat. I'm on a five-year appointment to do specifically consular work and uh, with my language requirement. The career track doesn't require a language. Um, and my colleagues can speak to the different ways it'll help you having a language coming in. There, there's a point system where you get extra points for languages and then they'll train you uh, in languages if they decide to send you to, you know, wherever they send you, pretty much they'll, they'll teach you the language. Um, but as far as, you know, needing a language to come in, uh, I believe it's only my program, the concert fellow program that requires a language. If I could uh, chime in real quick. Um, uh, I um, studied Portuguese in college and I got a scholarship from the federal government uh, through something called the National Security Education Program, a born scholarship when you're an undergrad and you apply for this scholarship for language training, uh, basically to study abroad um, in, in a different country, you're a scholar. They also have a, a scholarship for graduate students called the Boren Fellowship um, that pays uh, for you to study the language overseas. And I would highly recommend looking into this as a resource um, because language sort of acquisition is sort of accelerated when you study uh, in country and are immersed in, in, in the in the environment. Um, and there's an added benefit to NSEP born scholars and fellows, which is that uh, non-competitive eligibility that Catherine mentioned um, that she had after Peace Corps, you also get when you are a born scholar or fellow. And so it helps you when you're applying for civil service jobs in the federal government. Um, and the, they do that because the federal government is paying you to study these languages to eventually attract you as a language train language capable talent. Great. Um, Arabic, Danye, did you have to learn any Arabic? I did. And I always joke. So I mentioned before that I actually studied Japanese. So I took Japanese for eight years. I took it all four years of high school and all four years of undergrad. And then when it comes time to bid, right, the thing that's available for um, the position that I wanted was in Saudi. And so I joke, I'm like, study Japanese and they'll send you to the Middle East, right? So I had to study, um, I had to study Arabic and I actually studied twice. So when you look for your jobs, they give you a list of all the jobs that are available and the cities um, and countries that they're available in, right? And you actually apply for those jobs before you leave your current position and before you go to your next position. So you're looking for a job. That said, um, before I went to Dahran, before I went to Saudi, I was required to get what they call as like a 2-2. So I had to be, uh, I would say pretty low intermediate somewhat um, in my ability to speak Arabic before I went to Saudi. And so I studied for, I wanna say it was eight or nine months program. And I think Catherine had mentioned it before, but there's the Foreign Service Institute that's in Virginia. And that's where they teach you your languages. So I studied in uh, Virginia for that eight months. Then I did my tour in Saudi. I went back and did a tour in Washington, DC. And then I got a job in Cairo. And it required me to move up in terms into an increase and advance my level of understanding in Arabic. And so I did like a refresher course at the school again in Virginia. And then when I went to Cairo, I studied for an academic year to move up to the advanced level of Arabic. Um, it's awesome to get paid to study a language, right? Especially when you're used to paying as a student, right? You pay to learn the language and now they're paying you. So that feels awesome. Um, but I will note that I do think my Arabic was pretty decent. Um, it's much better than my Spanish. So forgive me for that, right? I'm gonna work on that while I'm here. But um, they teach you the language for your job. They don't teach you the language for your day-to-day -day life. 
So I could easily talk about the bilateral relationship between the two countries and, you know, education reform, but I could not ask for a spoon, right? So those are things that you study on your own, but coming in with language skills is definitely um, a plus. They will test you for those when you come in. And I will also encourage everyone to do a study abroad program. I don't care if it's just for a month, go abroad, see what it's like to live overseas, see if you're able to do it, see how you're able to adjust. Um, it's, it's an experience and it can be overwhelming. And so to kind of ease yourself into that process, I think it's a good thing. Thank you so much. So I know we're over time, but I would love Nathan as a diplomat in residence to Give us a little bit of practical information, maybe when tests are, what people should know, what programs um, our, our audience should know about right now. Sure. Um, and just piggybacking off of that last question, those, those study abroad programs that we have, I put a few in the chat box already, um, those are great scaffolding type programs, like programs that you build off of to eventually make your way into the foreign service. So as I kind of hinted when I was speaking about my path to the foreign service, I, I said that I did an unpaid internship um, in between my two years of grad school. And I said that that was probably my most crucial step. Those student programs that we have are really valuable for getting your feet in the door at the State Department, whether it be an internship, whether paid or unpaid we have. Well, first, all of our programs are on careers.state.gov. And I'll put that in the chat box as well. Careers.state.gov is where you'll find all of those programs, whether it be like the unpaid internship program or the US Foreign Service internship program, which is a paid one um, for two consecutive summers, or, um, or the virtual student federal service, which is a virtual internship program, or the fellowships, like one that, that um, Danye said, said that she did, was it was a Pickering fellowship or the Wrangell Fellowship, those, those are some of our most valuable ones because they pay for graduate school and they give you two paid internships while you're in graduate school and they bring you into the foreign service when you graduate. So, I mean, so those are some of the most valuable ones for people who know that this is what they wanna do, I highly recommend it. And just to drop a quick stat about our last cohort of Pickerings and Wrangles who came in this past year, they there was 90 of them were selected 76 percent of them already had another state department student program under their belt before they applied to be a pickering or wrangle so so that's the importance of our student programs you can build on them from like your sophomore year on up uh, or or even our um our study abroad programs like as Luis was talking about he, he applied for like the the boring award, which is actually a Department of Defense one, but it works for us as well, because you're out there learning a language. Um, I put a few in the chat box, like the Critical Language Scholarship, which you can learn Arabic on, Teresa, um, or or the, the the Gilman Scholarship, which can send you to, to study abroad. And if you're studying a language abroad, you can get an additional sum of money on top of what you would originally get. Um, right now, most of our student programs, they have their deadlines for application in the early fall. So between August to October is when those, those deadlines are for most of them. Um, so, so, you, so you have to be thinking about it during the summer and be ready to apply as soon as they open because they only stay open for a limited amount of time for most of them. Right now, what's open though, what I would like for people to look at is um, the Wrangell Summer Enrichment Program. That one just opened last week. It'll be open until February 15th. Wrangell Summer Enrichment Program. What it does is, um, well, you can be a sophomore, junior, or senior to apply for this one. What it does is it sends you to some, to a summer program at Howard University um, for like six weeks where you take certain classes on foreign policy and writing and you, and you meet a lot of people in this arena. And um, it's seen as a stepping stone to potentially applying for a Wrangell Fellowship later you know, to, to getting that that bigger one that pays for grad school. So so think about that one. That one's going to be open until February 15th. Another one that's open until late January is something called FATE, F-A-I-T, the Foreign Affairs Information Technology Fellowship. And it's for computer science majors. It's for IT-related majors. Um, you can apply as a sophomore or a senior. And it does what the Pickering and the Wrangell does. It, it pays for two years of school, 
either your junior and senior year or two years of grad school. And it gives you two paid internships and it brings you into the foreign service when you graduate as an IT specialist. Um, so we have lots and lots of different student program opportunities. And like I said, these, these are the way to get your foot in the door. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a different game once you're not in student status to try to get your foot in the door, but use your student status and, and go ahead and apply for these student programs. That's the best way. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. I wish I had known about these amazing programs when I was in college a long, long time ago. Um, and just a little shout out that there's also the political route. Um, I was a political appointee at the State Department, which is a, another potential way to, um, to work in this uh, international environment. Um, so if there are any, anybody have any other questions, please raise your hands, um, drop it in the chat. We are way over time, but um, if not, I just want to thank everybody. Um, actually, Nathan, do you have, have you heard when UNM might be getting our new diplomat in residence? Any word on that? I have not yet. My colleague just retired and, I, and we haven't, they haven't identified a replacement yet. Well, hopefully soon we'll be getting someone for New Mexico. Um, and if not, uh, again, you can email me and I can uh, try to find someone who can You can talk email me. <laughs> yes, you can right. email Nathan um, if you're interested in getting more information. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate all of the time that everyone has given tonight. Um, and thank you for your service to our country. Um, Lenny, I will pass it to you if uh, you want to close out for us. I just wanted to thank everybody for sharing their expertise with us. We really appreciate it. And we hope to continue this um, career events series that we, we've been organizing throughout the semester. We hope to continue it in January where we will bring um, experts work in the nonprofit area and in the non NGOs areas. Um, so thank you all and hope to see you in a future event. Take care.